Good afternoon and welcome to City Club of Portland's Friday Forum, Oregon's premier public affairs forum. I'm Sue Thomas, president of City Club, and I welcome you all. Those of you here at the Governor Hotel and those of you listening on OPB or KBPS radio or watching on Portland Community Media's CityNet 30. Thank you for joining City Club today on January Friday 29th for this week's Friday Forum. Today we will hear an examination of American immigration reform through the immigrants' personal stories. But first, some announcements. In consideration of those sitting close to you and those in our radio and television audiences, I ask that everyone who has not already done so to please silence your cell phones right now. As always, we offer our, our appreciation to our Friday Forum corporate sponsors whose generous financial support make these time-honored City Club luncheons possible. Please join me in offering our appreciation to our winter, corporate, winter quarter sponsors, Stoll Reeves, The Standard, and West Coast Bank. We greatly appreciate your support. If your company or firm would like to be a City Club sponsor, please contact City Club staff at the back of the room or call the City Club office. As you know, City Club's mission is to arouse in the citizens of this region uh, a, a desire for learning about and engaging in issues of importance, both in our local, our regional, and sometimes in our national community. Uh, next week, City Club is offering several opportunities to do just that. On February 1st, we have two events taking place. You can join us that evening for a panel discussion of the potential paths forward for the healthcare debate. Also on the same evening, we are hosting a panel discussion on human trafficking, an issue that's particularly timely at this moment as we watch the events unfolding in Haiti. Please join us at one of these upcoming events, uh, which you can learn more about on the City Club website. At next week's Friday Forum, Mayor Sam Adams will offer his State of the City Address. Uh, reservations are going fast, so if you want a seat at the table, please book now. And now on to today's program. Mexican immigrants often endure both physical and emotional trauma to cross the border into the United States, only to find themselves working in some of America's most dangerous industries. Today's speaker will examine American immigration reform through the stories of those immigrants. He will discuss the unique qualities that immigrant populations have that can strengthen American democracy and develop creative solutions to social problems that intertwine the fates of all. Today's speaker is the chair of political science at Whitman College in Walla Walla, Washington, where he has taught US politics and political theory since 1997. He is the author of two books, including Breaks in the Chain, What Immigrant Workers Can Teach Americans About Democracy. A Pennsylvania native, today's speaker once worked as a national field staff for the 1992 Dukakis and Clinton presidential campaigns, as well as serving as congressional aide in the Massachusetts state government. He is currently an innovative leader in community-based research projects, such as the program he founded in 2005 at Whitman called The State of the State for Washington Latinos. Please help me welcome today's speaker, President Paul Apostolidis. Good afternoon. It gives me great pleasure to be here with you all today. Um, I want to thank Sue Thomas for her kind introduction, um, Patty Tillett for arranging this talk, even though he couldn't be here today, and also my good friend Melody Rose uh, for letting me know about the wonderful work that City Club has been doing. Uh, for quite some time now, uh, momentum has been building for Congress once again to take up the historically vexed issue of immigration reform. Whether or not this happens in 2010, as the administration and some congressional leaders have indicated it will, the latest in a succession of national debates about immigration is well underway, in the media, in the blogosphere, on the 2008 campaign trail, and in many local communities, heated discussions are taking place about whether and how to legalize the millions of people who live and work here unlawfully, and what the conditions are for full participation in American society. Today, I'd like to suggest that policymakers and people of goodwill think more critically about the terms in which the public debate about immigration is being waged. Now, many of you are doubtless familiar with the key questions that legislators and advocates are asking right now as immigration reform may be moving forward. Should those who seek legalization be compelled to pay a fine and punishment of their prior evasions of the law? <laughs> 
Should they be required to demonstrate knowledge of English to assure Americans that they'll be able to integrate into the mainstream culture? And as we open the door to millions of people, what new security efforts should uh, be undertaken along our borders to keep millions more from entering the country illegally in the future? Now, notice the pattern of relations that all of these questions set up. In all these matters, it's we, the American governments and people, who are uh, acting, and they, the undocumented immigrants, who are responding, being made to behave in certain ways or locate themselves in certain places by an agency, by which I mean a capacity to act, that they themselves do not possess. And notice, too, how the assumption here is that only after immigrants are induced to do certain things, like pay fines and learn English, only then will they be in a position uh, to join with others to craft the society where they live in responsible and meaningful ways. Well, what I will suggest this afternoon is that a better immigration policy will result if leaders and ordinary people pay more attention to the types of agency that immigrants exercise all the time and that already help make our society what it is in fundamental ways. And to make these capacities of immigrants concrete for you, I'm going to talk specifically about the role of immigrants in the production and consumption of food in the United States. So my talk today has two parts. In the first part, I'll be talking about how immigrants act as agents who feed our bodies. And in the second part of the lecture, we'll look at how they are agents who have much to teach us about the meaning of democracy. Now, most of us know that immigrant workers are heavily concentrated in the food economy as restaurant workers, dairy workers, uh, farm workers, and employees in the food processing industries. When I began my research for my new book, Breaks in the Chain, I set out to interview dozens of workers in one industry in particular that has come to rely very heavily on immigrant labor since the 1960s, and that's the meatpacking industry. The stories these immigrant workers told my research assistant and me as we collected their oral histories offer much to contemplate as the new immigration debate gets underway. First, these were the stories of people who almost all gained legalization through the last major round of uh, legalization, which was put in place by the 1986 IRCA, the Immigration Reform and Control Act. They were the life stories of people who had grown up in Mexico during better times uh, and then left as the consequences of the global shift toward neoliberalism began to unfold. In Mexico, that meant rising unemployment, food scarcity, diminishing educational opportunities, along with accelerating migration to the US and the fraying of community and family bonds. These were the stories of people who had braved the hazards of crossing the border clandestinely in an era before there were armed vigilante groups like the Minutemen, but still plenty of dangers. This was also before the US crackdown on uh, immigration in cities like El Paso and San Diego had shunted illegal immigration traffic off into the mortally perilous terrain of the Southwest desert. Yet it was still a time when crossing the border without documents sometimes meant risking your life. Then after some years of working mostly in the fields and after becoming legalized, these individuals had found jobs working in the country's most dangerous industry. They worked at a major cattle slaughterhouse and processing facility owned until 2001 by IBP uh, and now by Tyson Foods. Tyson is the world's largest producer of fresh chicken, beef, and pork commodities. And its plant near Pasco, Washington is also one of the most dangerous factories in the country for workers with a rate of serious job-related injuries exceeding 25%. That means more than one in four workers is likely to experience an injury or health problem severe enough for the company to give the worker a day off work and report the problem to the Federal Occupational Safety and Health Administration. Finally, the stories we gathered came from people who had done something rare among immigrant workers today, although it is part of a long historical legacy. They had organized themselves politically creating movement that lasted 10 solid years. Together, they took control of their union, uh, Teamsters Local 556, and they democratized its internal structure. They fought to make working conditions safer in the factory and to give workers the courage to defend their rights on the job. And they also reached out to consumers, to small business people, to students, to religious people, and other members of the public to formulate a, a common plan of action to make meat production safer and healthier for everyone. 
So as Congress mulls over a new major legalization process, I think we should be curious about what life has been like for the last cohort of immigrants to go through a process of this sort. And these interviews tell us some important things in that regard. Well, what happened to the people who got legalized last time? Well, much as they had done before, they got their papers. They ended up producing the food that nourishes Americans' bodies under conditions that damage their own bodies. Now let's look more closely at this relationship between the bodies of immigrants and the bodies of more economically and racially privileged groups in the United States today. Now it's not saying something particularly new to note that uh, immigrants produce much of the food that is marketed and consumed in the United States. That's what growers note, for instance, when they remind us of the apple worker shortages a few years ago up in Washington state, and when they argue that immigration policies have got to accommodate the labor needs of the agricultural industry. But what is not commonly said in connection with this observation is that immigrants do such work at grave consequences to themselves, a cost that the wages they earn do not even begin to compensate. Because along with the market logic, Linking the fates of food consumers to those of immigrant workers, there is also what I would call a metabolic logic. According to the market logic, immigrants get the jobs, and thus the income from those jobs, and consumers get commodity choices. So uh, in the beef industry, for example, the people that we interviewed got year-round uh, steady jobs with union wages and benefits, and this was a real improvement for them over the um, much less stable jobs that they'd held previously, working in the pear and cherry orchards, uh, working only seasonally, earning low wages in jobs where they had no benefits, and working out under the open sky rather than under a roof. Meanwhile, shoppers at Walmart or Albertsons can uh, walk into the meat section and know that they'll find stacks of packaged, dated, USDA-inspected meat products of all sorts. Uh, from ground beef to strip steaks, ribs, and chuck roasts, and all the rest. But now, let's consider what I'm calling this additional relation on the metabolic level that entwines the bodily fates of immigrant workers and more economically and racially privileged meat consumers. The basic point here is that the bodily health, security, and nourishment of middle-class white Americans has become directly contingent on the physical and psychological misery of immigrant food processing workers. And the character of this bodily misery is not just a matter of injuries that come from working on the cattle disassembly line, uh, although this is a crucial and disturbing part of the picture. Rather, the exposure of immigrant bodies to heightened risks of mortality and morbidity is a systematic process. It occurs um, over time, it, occurs, it extends over many varied locations, uh, and it has multiple components. Passages from our interviews shed light on the different pieces of this debilitating process, the links in the chain of events that brought these workers from villages and cities in Mexico to the slaughterhouse in Pasco. I'm gonna read some of those uh, excerpts for you right now. Well, here's how a man whom I call Gilberto Rivera in the book, where I use pseudonyms, described his harrowing experience riding in a van that was packed body to body when he was crossing the border. We had the feeling that we were starting to run out of air. We were breathing, but it was hot air. Steam, like in a sauna. The trailer had no air conditioning. It just had a little hole in the floor. And when it was running along, a little bit of air came in. But all these desperate people wouldn't keep to one side so that the air could come in. They all wanted to be in front of the little hole. And then the desperation of all these people started to spread to the others. There were about seven children in there. There were about 15 women. And it didn't matter to anyone whether there were children, whether there were women. What we all were trying to do was to breathe air. Now fast forward from a border crossing to the stories about working here without documents. Like this one from Pedro Ruiz, who told us what happened the night that his daughter was born after he had spent the day working in the orchard. Quote, when my girl, my first girl was born, I was out pruning and five of us had to go to the hospital. For five days I couldn't see anything. There had been a big snowfall, and the trees had snow on them, and the sun came out, and steam started to rise up. I don't know, but I think the tree had a chemical on it that hurt us. My eyes swelled up. I couldn't see my wife. And that very day, her water broke. I had to take her to the hospital at like 2 in the morning, and I couldn't see. My eyes were burning. And then his wife, who was there, chimed in. She said, with the road full of snow, and he's asking me, am I going the right way? Am I going the right way? Me with really strong pains. 
So it, there's kind of a humorous side to these stories sometimes, but I think you can also see how these excerpts illustrate vividly what the physical and psychological experience was like for people who crossed the border without documents and then went to work in the informal economy. As we heard over and over again, it was an experience of being immobilized and incapacitated. It compromised one's basic bodily functions and capacities. Time and again, people told us how they found themselves in situations where they couldn't move, they couldn't breathe, they couldn't see, they couldn't urinate. They were desperately hungry or thirsty. They didn't know where they were or where they were going. The loss of command over one's own body was severe. It was humiliating. It was sometimes life-threatening, as in Rivera's case. And it was often heartbreaking, as in the moment when uh, Ruiz's newborn child first opened her eyes and he couldn't see her because his eyes were swollen shut. Now fast forward again to the time after legalization when these same individuals had been freed from the hazards of crossing the border and clandestine work in the fields, but now they're exposed to different forms of bodily endangerment and psychological distress in the slaughterhouse. Now just briefly, a few words about why it is that health and safety problems abound in the meatpacking industry today. So back in the early 20th century, um, uh, meatpacking workers used to do some highly skilled butchering jobs. So they would make multiple cuts on the same hunk of meat, and there also was not any automation in the process. Um, but in the 1960s, IBP made some major innovations that revolutionized the industry. So IBP's plan was to earn higher rates of profit by mechanizing and by intensifying the division of labor. This meant de-skilling workers' jobs, down to where each worker would make just one cut on a piece of the carcass all, uh, over and over all day long. IBP also automated the labor process. So workers today talk about the chain, uh, which is the mechanical apparatus that moves the meat around the factory the, on the inside. So workers in processing, for example, stand there with a big hook in one hand and a knife in the other hand. And the chain comes around and they grab a piece of meat off of the chain, they bring it down, they make their cut, they hang it up again, and then they grab the next one over and over again uh, as, as the day goes on. And the, the, the work process is measured in seconds. It's determined in that, with that much precision. Well, these new developments by IBP and the other big companies made it possible to speed up the labor process dramatically. So the companies could turn out much higher volumes, keep prices low, and realize profits um, by selling vast quantities of product to consumers at very low profit margins. But the problem for workers, of course, has been a distressing rise uh, in job-related injuries since these changes took place. So we've seen a proliferation of musculoskeletal disorders from people doing re uh, repetitive motions on heavy objects at high speeds. Workers also suffer frequent lacerations from fast-moving knives, along with spinal injuries from falling as they rush across floors that are frequently slick with blood and fat from the animals. So now I'll tell you a bit about how the Tyson workers conveyed to us what it was like to work under these conditions. Here's a fellow I call Alejandro Mendez, describing why he found it impossible to take English classes after work that he knew he needed to gain some upward mobility. Although, like so many others we talked to, he had really tried. Quote, no job is easy, but it's very different to leave work tired than to leave work in pain. Fatigue is one part of it, but the greater part isn't fatigue. It's pain from doing the same job that is so repetitive to the point where the people, when we get home, we lie down and we can't sleep. We get up right away. Our fingers, our hands fall asleep from that same pain. The next day, we get up with hands that are in pain and that have fallen asleep making little movements to try to get the blood flowing. That's why I say that this job is hard. It's not a matter of leaving work tired. You leave work injured. Person after person whom we interviewed confirmed that to work at Tyson was to live in constant bodily pain. And as a student of mine argued in a psychology thesis that she wrote several years ago about these workers, it was also to adopt an understanding of quote unquote normal pain quite different from that of most other people. So what happened when the workers couldn't bear the pain anymore, um, and when supervisors could no longer delay referring them for health services as they typically did? Well, Alejandro Mendez's wife, Elvira, also worked in the factory. We interviewed her one day in her kitchen. We were interrupted now and then when her grandchildren came running through or when she got up to stir a pot of pozole that she had on the stove and from which she filled some bowls for us afterward. <laughs> 
At one point, she was describing how she'd gotten injured at work. And she stopped, and she held out her arms side by side. And you could see that one arm was swollen to literally twice the size of the other one. What had happened, she said, echoing multiple other interviews that we conducted, uh, was that the company nurses and doctors had treated a serious musculoskeletal disorder with nothing more than ibuprofen. This had gone on for months, and Elvira Mendez was still fighting the company to get them to pay for treatment of the disorder rather than just alleviating the symptoms and to allow her to see a doctor of her own choice. Well, what I would assert today is that these immigrant workers' stories and the many others like them reveal to us in microcosm and in narrative form the basic outlines of a core structure of racial power that exists in our country today. In the words of the French political philosopher Michel Foucault, it is biopolitical power, power that governs the life chances and the physiological well-being of mass populations, power that differentiates these conditions for the racially privileged from those of racially subordinate groups like these Mexican immigrant meatpackers. It's power that constructs what I've been calling this metabolic connection between the fates of immigrant workers and those of middle class white Americans. So first, to go back to the material about crossing the border, there in the background of these individual stories about skirting close to death and enduring trauma on the border, there are our ceaselessly, almost mechanically repeated stories about how we have to secure the border through, it seems, never-ending deployments of police and military means. The US immigration system keeps making cross-border travel harder and harder on the bodies of immigrants. And like it or not, the bodily damages that people sustain crossing the border are part of our food production system because white middle-class America depends for its own bodily nourishment on the food that immigrants produce. It's the perversity of the situation that I want to underscore. You'd think that to bring people here to do these horrible jobs, we'd make the road as plush to travel as possible. Right? We'd do everything we could to strengthen their bodies so that they could endure what lies ahead. I don't know, free clinics with the Blazers trainers or Whole Foods coupons or something like that. <laughs> Instead, it's just the opposite. We make the journey ever more tortuous and life-threatening so that people can finally make it here only to subject their bodies to a whole new set of ordeals in the slaughterhouse. And likewise, behind the people's stories about their jobs at Tyson, about working in pain, getting injured, and having treatment denied or delayed, even after they have legal residency. Behind these personal narratives, there are a number of wider institutional backstories. One is a familiar story about how there are certain jobs that Americans just cannot or will not do, but that somehow are perfectly fine for immigrants. These are the jobs that carry higher occupational safety and health risks, and that have fewer health and retirement benefits, or none at all. And my point is that white middle-class America thrives relatively on jobs with better health plans and lower chances of job-related injuries because immigrants are channeled biopolitically into all those other jobs. Here's another backstory to the narratives about immigrants' misery in the slaughterhouse. It's the story of getting government off our backs, reasserting the rights of private property, and counting on the market rather than bureaucrats to protect the health and the well-being of working people. Well, meatpacking companies and construction firms told that story several years ago when they led passage of a state ballot initiative in the state of Washington to abolish that state's very progressive ergonomic standard. And the result was that the jobs for the people whose stories you just heard lost a chance of getting safer relative to the jobs that white middle class America keeps for itself. The last backstory that you can hear behind the narratives from our interviews is a story the Tyson Corporation loves to tell and that is central to the way that this very successful company presents itself to the public. It's a story about the American family sitting down to a Sunday pot roast after church on Sunday morning and a week of hard, earnest work. And you can see this story if you go to Tyson's website. Well, what does that meat symbolize? It symbolizes the solid nature of family life as the cultural underpinning of the nation. And it also represents the abundance of the American economy, the prosperity, the richness, the fat that it produces. So consumer demand for meat products stays high, and the industry continues to churn out um, high volumes of meat at low profit margins. But this means that immigrant workers like Elvira, Alejandro, uh, Gilberto, and Pedro uh, as another worker, worker put it, are working themselves to death so that the pot roast can make it to the Sunday dinner table. <laughs>
Now, none of those backstories about securing our borders or the jobs that Americans will not do or letting the market do its work or the Sunday family pot roast, none of those stories are explicitly about white people or brown people or black or Asian people. And yet they all fasten together a social metabolic relation in which white middle class bodies gain vigor and protection through the heightened exposure of brown immigrant bodies to death, injury, illness, and trauma. My point is that the effort to reform immigration needs to take this situation into account because it need not be this way. We miss this if we reduce the question of a person's right to be fully included in this society to whether that person has violated a documentation law, paid a fine, or learned how to conjugate verbs in English. Rather, a realistic assessment of the social position and activities of immigrants should govern the way we look at legal and cultural matters. And this assessment must include recognizing the grave sacrifices of mind, body, and spirit that immigrants are making so that others may thrive. And it means that as America reforms immigration, policymakers, advocates, and people of goodwill ought to be asking far tougher questions like these. How can we make travel across the US-Mexico border less treacherous for immigrant workers? How can we ensure that economic conditions in Mexico improve so there isn't so much cross-border traffic to begin with? How can we ensure working people's rights to a safe workplace, rights that are enshrined in the Occupational Safety and Health Act of 1970, but have never been adequately enforced? How can we open the doors of education to immigrants and their children so that their chances for better jobs can expand? And finally, how are we feeding ourselves? And what is the real social human price of that Sunday pot roast or that burger on the dollar menu at McDonald's? A new immigration policy that looks at these hard issues squarely in the face, that's what I would call comprehensive immigration reform. And I would submit to you that any immigration reform that fails to address them will undermine its own efforts to create a more inclusive society, even if it endows legions of people with an unprecedented status before the law. Okay, so the final issue I want to spend time talking about today concerns the manner in which the new immigration policy is constructed and the role of immigrants themselves in that process. Given that the subtitle of my book, uh, Breaks in the Chain, is uh, What Immigrant Workers Can Teach America About Democracy, you might well suppose that I have something to say about this. We need to recognize that despite the power of those institutional backstories that I was just talking about with regard to public policy or corporate public relations, um, that immigrant workers are also helping to create the structure of racial power that I was discussing. They do this through the travels they undertake and the labors that they perform. Likewise, I want to add now that immigrant workers also help generate the political legitimacy that this system of biopolitics enjoys. And in turn, they can supply a crucial part of the political momentum to change it, although they cannot do so on their own. I want to close by reflecting on the politics of narratives. And I mean here the narratives of immigrant workers. One of the fascinating things for me about sifting through the transcripts from the interviews was to discover the subtle variations and the major patterns in the workers' accounts of their situations. You've already heard a couple examples of one of those patterns. So think back to Gilberto Rivera's story about nearly suffocating in the van as he was being taken across the border. Well, this is a good illustration of one very common current in the narratives. It's a story about immigrants who are rendered completely helpless by overwhelming, perilous forces uh, that they can neither foresee nor understand nor do anything to affect. And many people spoke about working at Tyson uh, as though this too meant being just a kind of plaything of blind fate. For instance, when they talked about feeling unable to do anything when supervis supervisors refused to let them go to the bathroom, or feeling compelled to work themselves far past the point where they knew their bodies could tolerate uh, because of the speed of the chain. The politics of this narrative frame, I would argue, is that it encourages a kind of despairing adjustment to the biopolitical system because an alternative becomes literally unimaginable. So there's a bit of irony here. I'm saying that even when workers represent themselves as being totally without any capacity to affect the world around them, precisely by talking about themselves in that way, they're acting on the world in ways that have real effects. <laughs> 
But there were other different kinds of stories the workers told about their circumstances on the border, in the factory, and in the movement they organized. So listen to another excerpt from our interview with Elvira Mendez when she told us about a problem she ran into while a coyote, or a human smuggler, was taking her across the border with her teenage daughter and several other children. Quote, they put us in there, in the car, my oldest daughter and me in the front, right with the driver, but at night, my oldest daughter told me, man, uh, mom, this man is grabbing my leg. It frightened me. I couldn't tell him, stop, let me out. I couldn't say anything because I thought if I said something to him, maybe he would take us to a different place. But at a gas station where we stopped, I told her, get out, my daughter. I sat down myself in the middle. And here in the interview, she says, excuse this word, I'm going to say a bad word. But I won't say it because we're on the radio. Uh, she said, I sat down there and I said, okay, you insert profanity about unsavory activities by the guy's mother. Uh, <laughs> now you just go ahead and grab my leg. No way they were gonna touch me who's already an old lady. And from then on, things were calm, end quote. <laughs> now what's remarkable about this little story um, is that it starts out as a tale of helpless victimization, but then the narrator turns the tables, and she uses her body and her voice in startling ways to neutralize the danger and to protect herself and her children. So in tension with what you might call the dominant storyline about being subject to the whims of fate, um, there was this other narrative current where people took small but significant steps to deal with a threat that was facing themselves or others, uh, whether it was their loved ones or even total strangers. Steps like standing up to this coyote or walking or dressing in a certain way so as not to attract suspicion, or even controlling one's own fear internally in a stressful situation. Another story that illustrates this other frame concerns a very mundane but persistent health hazard at the slaughterhouse. Um, so Jorge Hernandez's job at Tyson was to remove the cow's filthy hides after they were slaughtered and then wash them in tubs that were supposed to be treated daily with salt and chlorine. But, said Jorge, quote, they only put it in once a month and all the workers there get hives. The cows are animals that who knows what state they're in when they arrive. <laughs> and that's what makes you break out in rashes, in hives on your arms. But every break I put alcohol in my arms um, or if I don't, then when I get home, I put on creams and salt water, and I don't get an infection. And I tell everyone at work, and I tell them what to do so they don't get hives and rashes and all that. Now, what interests me here is not just what Hernandez is doing, but how he's talking about it. Um, when Hernandez talks about this daily ritual of applying alcohol and skin creams to his body, he's talking about himself in a way that emphasizes his own ability to act positively to affect the world around him, despite the massive skewing of power in the company's favor. And he's also presenting himself as an agent who can lead others toward developing their own similar kinds of agency in the workplace. Now, this kind of uh, this is kind of double-edged because we might think, oh, he's just rationalizing his own powerlessness to get the company to do its job. And we might think the same about workers who told similar stories, for example, about leaving the line to go to the nurse when they were injured, even though the supervisor forbade them. But as I think you can see, even if there is some rationalization in such stories, it doesn't take away the potential that they invoke, uh, evoke, that immigrant workers could teach themselves and one another to act on their own behalf to address problems at work. And it suggests that this potential for agency is there not just in these kinds of small, personal, run-of-the-mill situations, but maybe also in a much wider and more consequential social plane. Well, realizing this potential was exactly what the workers' union movement accomplished. That is, the movement translated the capacities that workers were able to exercise individually into new collective capabilities that posed the real prospect of changing policies and backstories on the institutional level. They gave voice to this notion of uh, collective power built on individual responsibility and agency when they invoked this slogan that they had come to use in their movement. And in Spanish, the phrase was, nosotros somos la unión which means we are the union, 
Elvira Mendez explained what this resonant slogan meant when she was speaking critically about some of her coworkers who hadn't really gotten the message yet about who had the power to change conditions at the plant and how this wasn't simply the job of the union's principal officer, who was a remarkable woman named Maria Martinez. Elvira said, they think because Maria is the principal officer of the union, they think she is the union. She's the principal officer of the union, but we all are the union. Not Maria, not even the shop stewards, all the teams of workers. You always have to do your part if you want things to turn out right. It's like a home. I could come to my home and just stay there sitting around all the time like I have nothing to do. Let's say my children are there. If I set the example of standing up to do something, they've all got to get up to help. So what did the workers do when they got up to help at Tyson? Well, they pulled off the largest uh, wildcat strike in the meatpacking industry in at least the last 25 years, in 1999, when 1,500 workers walked off the job. They also launched a wage and hour lawsuit um, to get the company to pay them for the time that they spent putting on and taking off their elaborate protective gear, and they won $8 million in back pay in what was the first decision, a unanimous decision, by the Roberts Supreme Court. And even more impressively, they claimed for themselves the position of people who were responsible for the well-being of society in general. They claimed this responsibility by partnering with other groups in the local community and beyond, even as far away as Japan. Um, uh, during contract negotiations in 2004, for example, they proposed that workers be given the right slash responsibility to halt the production line, not only if a serious hazard to a worker arose, but also if they identified a clear danger to consumers. Now, given that a key phase of this struggle occurred during the outbreak of mad cow disease, do you remember that, five years ago? six years ago, and the closing of global markets to American beef, it's not hard to see how real general social benefits could follow from meatpacking workers self-consciously and self-confidently taking on the role of being the people on the front lines uh, of ensuring food safety in this industry. And it was the same spirit of uh, collective power based on personal responsibility that made Teamsters Local 556 really a model of democracy in action. For one thing, after the transition, many more union officers were elected by the members rather than appointed, and many more workers voted. But democracy and the ethos of nosotros somos la union meant something much deeper than voting rights and elections. It also meant that workers took an active interest in running the union for themselves, and they expressed this by making the meetings frequent, participatory, and bilingual, and by continually striving to build the leadership capacities of ordinary workers, rather than encouraging them to view the union officers, or the company, or the state as their caretakers. And so, to conclude, and to put it in the terms I was using before, by reaping the collective rewards of their individual acts of self-assertion, these immigrant workers called into question the political legitimacy of that system of racial power that I described for you earlier. And we see this not only in their efforts to change the way things worked inside the factory and transform the met metabolic link between the nourishment of white middle-class America and the labor of brown immigrants, we also see it in the way they rejected the related assumption that helps keep this connection in place. The assumption that whatever the role is of immigrants in this society, it's a role that ought to be determined for them by other people. I am suggesting to the contrary that what immigrant workers can teach America about democracy is quite simply that we are the union. That we all, immigrants and native born alike, are responsible for the gross racial disparities that exist today and that standard practices on our border and our food industries create. Not the market, not some mythical clash of civilizations, Anglo-Protestant and Latin American, and not the war on terror, which can be used all too easily to avoid tough questions about justice and fairness. I'd like to see this spirit of democracy irrigate the rather dry discussion of immigration we are carrying on right now in this country. To do this would mean more deliberately bringing into the debate the organizations with which immigrants speak and act for themselves, recognizing the abilities of immigrants to deepen American democracy and to envision creative solutions to social problems that intertwine the fates of all of us. Doing this for many immigrant workers would oddly mean placing citizenship before legalization. But that's perhaps as it ought to be. If by democracy we mean not a given factual state of affairs to be legally administered, but rather an ideal that we have yet to reach, 
and that demands engagement politically if we really want to achieve it. Thanks. Thank you, Paul. Our host today, the first question is asked by our host today, which is City Club Governor Promise King. Promise is the executive director of the Oregon League of Minority Voters and wrote on race and politics as a columnist for the Portland Tribune. He's been a City Club member since 2008. Promise? Thank you very much. If we are a nation of immigrants, What's the source of our emotional intensity and controversy around this subject? Well, I think the notion of, of our being a nation of immigrants uh, often comes out and comes into play as a way of uh, kind of covering over the really deep divisions that I was just talking about that, that exist today. The fact is that in some ways, uh, things are very similar for today's immigrant groups to, those, to the ways that they were for prior immigrant generations, uh, like my own Greek forebears. And in some ways, they're, they're very, very different. Uh, I think there's a, there's a way that people are more entrenched in these kinds of jobs these days, in particular, um, than, than it used to be in the past. Uh, so when we start talking about a nation of immigrants, it's, this, it's the way we talk of, uh, <laughs> like the way we talk about the, the economy, as though there is just one economy in which everyone has a, you know, has a similar stake. In fact, it's, it's not so simple. When Tyson does well, certain people have their bodies damaged, right? So uh, I think we actually ought to be careful about how we use the, the rhetoric about this being a nation of immigrants. Yes, let's recognize that um, people are here who come from all over the place and that striving for communication and understanding and justice among people who come from very different backgrounds is a tremendous, tremendous and increasing challenge. Um, but let's not use that rhetoric as a way to gloss over um, the problems and disparities that, that exist. We'll now take questions from the floor. Asking questions at a Friday Forum is the privilege of City Club membership. When you ask your question, ask it in 30 seconds or less and identify yourself as a club member. Uh, Gilly Burlingham. Unfortunately, I've known all the horror stories because I own a farm in Western New York and I've been an environmental activist. Mm -hmm. My question to you is don't you think it's time, and I hope you can find the author, to write this situation. I, I didn't know about the hopeful part, but what a novel it would make, like Uncle Tom's <laughs> Cabin, like The Jungle. Can you please find the author who will write this story so the general public will have their consciences raised? I'll work on it. I've, I've won. <laughs> you know, the, uh, one of the things in the academic industry is you get, you get kind of caught up in, you know, tenure and promotion, and you have to write the academic book. Um, but I think that a lot of the material in the book that I've written um, would actually provide the, a great basis for a more popular book. And they've got to give me a four-year sabbatical. That's right. <laughs> Hi, I'm Leslie Hill Duell, a City Club member. I was wondering, do we need to be looking to the European Union as mm. a model of where to go with this? Because they also had, over time, over their history, that same real interconnectedness between mm. the various countries on their continent. And over time, they said, let's have a free flow of labor, of capital, um, and goods and services mm -hmm. without these artificial barriers so that people could go where the jobs were, they could go where people needed their work, their labor. Yeah. Um, is that the model we need to think about over time? Possibly in some ways. I mean, as, as uh, everyone knows, I think you know, European societies are historically more comfortable with being multilingual and multicultural than, than the United States. And there's a, a way that different cultures in such close proximity and economic reliance have had to learn about each other more deeply um, than, we have, than we have here. There's an insularity to American culture that I think really needs to be overcome. Um, the European, I don't, I'm, I'm not a scholar of, of European politics, so I'm not speaking to this out of my professional expertise, but the European countries, from what I understand, have actually been um, you know, gone much further in terms of continental political integration in the EU at um, 
you know, uh, letting go of certain powers of individual nation states in the interest of a more rational governing scheme for the whole, uh, you know, for the whole region. At the same time, uh, there are still problems that involve the entry of immigrants into European Union states from outside. I was just reading about how in Greece, actually in northeast, in north uh, eastern Greece, um, there has been a real spike in illegal immigration. A lot of them Afghans being brought over by Turkish smugglers and that the Greeks are now setting up detention camps on the islands. Uh, I don't want to blow this out of proportion, but there are thousands of people involved. Um, and uh, so there is, you know, his, Europe has its own racism uh, historically uh, directed at uh, Africa and the Middle East. So, um, so in some ways, y Europe may provide an answer in some ways they're involved in some of the same processes that we are. They too are in the process of beefing up their border security operations. Um, and I personally am interested in finding out more about what's going on right now in, in uh, Western Greece. So, yeah. Greg McPherson, City Club member. One of the themes one hears from uh, anti-immigrant activists is that uh, immigrants should be required to learn English. And while their motivations may be nativist, mm. uh, wouldn't the learning of English enhance the political power of immigrant communities so they can protect themselves in the workplace? Absolutely, absolutely. And I, I honestly have never, I've spent a lot of time in immigrant communities in Eastern Washington, both as a result of the research that I did for this book uh, and some new research on day laborers and um, also uh, as a teacher conducting, um, supervising my students' own independent research projects on Latinos in Washington State. And my kids go to schools in Walla Walla that are like 50% Hispanic. So I meet the parents. I have not met the person to date who hasn't wanted to and tried to learn English. The obstacle for a lot of people that I think uh, if you're not in touch with the community, you just, it's very hard to grasp. I certainly didn't grasp it until I sat in people's living rooms and over and over again had them tell me these stories. But, you know, you think, okay, learn English, right? Or you think, especially if uh, things have, like, Walla Walla Community College has a free English language program available through Tyson. But the workers can't go. I mean, they go, they try to make it through it for a couple of weeks, and they're so tired and so much in pain and so stressed from the kind of work that they're doing that it is not possible for them under those conditions. So they try for a while, they fall asleep in class, and then they just give up. And they think, okay, well, my kids are gonna learn it. And in fact, studies show us that contrary to what some people are saying out there, the second generation is learning English at rates just like older immigrant groups like Greeks, Italians, Poles, um, you know, 91%. Uh, this is Pew Hispanic Center data and data from the American Prospect magazine. So the problem is not with the second and third generations. Uh, and I think it's also not a problem of motivation. The problem is structural. It's what, what are the day-to-day -day conditions of people's lives? And that's, I think, the value of this kind of research that really gets into people's um, individual stories and spends the time that you need to get behind those, those numbers. Bob Geary, member. Um, before I ask my question, could I just refer that the typical Mexican immigrant is illiterate in his or her own culture? Um, before I ask my question, also I should identify myself as a retired U.S. immigration officer. In 1986, you mentioned that law. The Denver district where I was employed could say that three out of four applicants submitted a fraudulent application. I happen to be the son of immigrants. Uh, my question is, what kind of thinking does a man or woman have who would enter a country illegally? Well, these interviews show a lot about what the kinds of thinking are that people have. Some of them think very carefully about the welfare of their children and the, the ability of their children to have enough food to eat, a house to live in, a school to go to. Um, when the economic crisis hit in Mexico in the 1980s, uh, there was a kind of a mass population shift of children out of school because families couldn't afford to feed themselves without more child labor. Virtually all of the people that I talked to had worked from the time when they were two years old or up. Uh, not something that I grew up with growing up in Philadelphia. 
um, but that was the norm for these folks. I also would take issue with your comment. I mean, I guess you know what you say is based on your work experience and your contact with you know with uh, probably numbers, great numbers of people. In my own research and my own uh, experiences with folks, uh, I, I would not, not say that people were illiterate in their own culture, nor even that there was just one single Mexican culture. One of the interesting things about this group of workers is that they, they, kind, they came from all over Mexico. Uh, you often have the pattern of immigration where people from just you know, one small community in Michoacan or um, Hidalgo or whatever it is, come and kind of relocate in one particular town in the United States. And what was fascinating about these folks is that they really did kind of evolve a pan-cultural movement. They were from all over Mexico. Some were from a more indigenous background, some from a more Hispano background, um, and were able to forge this kind of collaborative ethos. So that's what I, th I think people think about the, 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 the future of their families. They think about their own individual ability to work as hard as they want to. I had a guy, uh, the guy one of the guys I quoted here, who said that he traveled all around Mexico looking for uh, sufficient work. Um, and uh, came because he wanted to work harder. Uh, so um, that would be my answer to your question. Thank you. Carl Twombly, City Club member. Um, couldn't a lot of the problem be solved by reducing the amount of influence that large corporations have to prevent exploitation of workers uh, in general and focus <laughs> on keeping workers safe and healthy in all jobs. Yeah, um, yeah and I think that's a, that's, that point is, is well taken. I think, um, and I think actually that people might not like to hear this a lot of the time, but unions are really important for that to happen. The National Council of La Raza just issued a very, very forward-thinking report on health and safety problems at work that Hispanic Americans suffer disproportionately uh, relative to the rest of the population. And it's a really interesting report. You should check it out at nclr.org um, because it talks about the bigger picture, the bigger context for these health and safety problems that I've been talking about with you today. Um, at the same time, they didn't say anything about unions. And the fact of the matter is that without this union movement at this Tyson plant, uh, there would not have been any progress, even temporarily, uh, for workers there in terms of um, the work becoming slightly more um, you know, conducive to the, to the health of people's bodies, even with the union there. And this sort of you know, cultural sense that workers really could do something for themselves, not just individually, but as a group, um, you know, there were still plenty of problems. Um, it seems like the workers were exploited because they're less likely to complain because of their legal status. So right. it's a, a way of taking advantage of workers, sure. both here and, in, and, like you said, in Europe, the same problems. They're just taking advantage of whoever the latest group is they can take advantage of. Yeah. But remember, this is, these are workers who legalized in 1986 and didn't go to work in the slaughterhouse until afterwards. So it's not just a question of being undocumented. It's racial. It's, it's both documented and undocumented immigrants. Anderson member, following up on a comment you made earlier, what do we as a world, part of a world community do to improve conditions around the world? Because as bad as things are here, uh, they're worse other, uh, uh, other places. That's why people are coming here. Uh -huh. And two, if that happens, what happens to the food industry? I think a terrifically important thing that we could do that the president spoke about now and then on the campaign trail, um, but for which there has been no follow-up, is uh, strengthening the protections for labor that are involved in the North American Free Trade Agreement with Mexico. It was said at the time, back in 1992, 93, when this was, 94? Early 90s, when this was passed, um, that, you know, yeah, we're gonna have economic integration and we'll, you know, facilitate the greater, easier flow of capital across national borders, and we'll also pro uh, ensure protection for workers and protection for the environment. The latter two, we've yet to accomplish. I think there needs to be stronger leadership in, in that regard when we, when we get to the, on the terrain of these international treaties. And if that happens, yeah. what happens to that immigrant workforce that doesn't come here anymore? What happens to the food, food industry? 
Well, the food industry might, um, might need to, uh, this is just speculation now, but they might need to uh, make the jobs safer and more attractive to uh, domestic laborers. It really was a white male family earner uh, middle class occupation up through the 1950s. It was a, it was well re the work was well regarded, and the fact is that the, the bottom fell out of wages in the meatpacking industry between 1950 and 1975. Yeah. Yeah. Ted Kay, City Club member. The current decennial census must deal with the very real challenge of potentially undercounting certain segments of our population, mm -hmm. such as illegal aliens. The various remedies are very politically charged and debated. Would you comment on this issue from your perspective, please? You mean, uh, how best can the census make sure that it does count the number of people who are here? Yes. Illegally. Um, well, first of all, I think they ought to be making all kinds of efforts to count the people who are here uh, illegally. Um, because there are, as you know, all kinds of uh, government grants and calculations that are made in terms of the distribution of various social benefits that depend on uh, assessments of population composition. And if you don't have a realistic assessment, you're not going to you know, meet the need that's there. Um, I think you know, one of the things that we've learned at Whitman College, the students and my colleagues and myself in our uh, work with Latino communities in Eastern Washington State is that you, is that you have to work through both formal and informal networks if you're going to communicate with people. And I guess I would include finding people and uh, you know, in, in the endeavor that the census is undertaking as part of that task of communication. Um, so for example, when it comes to trying to uh, enhance uh, Mexican-American voter participation, it doesn't work for the Democratic Party or the Republican Party just to sort of put up a website or call a meeting. You have to sort of find out who the leaders are on the ground in the local community who will talk to each other informally, you know, through whatever means. It doesn't even work to just put up a, a, you know, a bulletin on the board after mass at the Catholic Church, right? You have, to, you have to work through the community in an intensive way. I don't know how well prepared the census uh, uh, commission is to undertake that kind of task, but I think it would be very um, worthwhile. Joella Worland, club member. Would you comment about women uh, in this organizational effort? Is there a, uh, a separate movement uh, by women, or are, is it all one movement uh, as you're describing it? Right. Thank That's you. That's a very interesting question. I actually wrote an article about the women specifically for this um, movement. It's in the journal called Signs, and it came out last year. Uh, so if you just go to Signs, journal on the web uh, and look for it last year, you can find it. But I mean, one really interesting thing about this movement was that the primary leader was a woman, a Mexican-American woman, Maria Martinez, just an extraordinary person. And one of the things that made her very special was that she was fully bilingual and she had the life experience of working all her, even though she was born in Los Angeles, she had uh, worked all her life with Mexican immigrant workers. And so it wasn't just that she could speak the language, she could speak the language, right? She understood. And she could really be, uh, and plus she had a, a remarkable power of charisma and just sort of self-confidence. So, um, so th that was a remarkable thing. And there was certainly uh, a dose of uh, sexism, I would say, in a small kind of um, counter-reform movement that grew up within the union, that collaborated with the company ultimately in getting the union abolished, which happened in 2005. It was all men that were uh, leaders of the other, of this counter-reform contingent, and they tended to paint Maria as a loudmouth, someone you know who was too loud and spoke out too much, um, and who really, in the beginning, was their front person for the guys who were really running the show. Um, it was pretty amazing, nonetheless, how the reformers uh, really did cultivate an ethic of respect between men and between women. And women were some of the foremost public speakers for this, uh, you know, for this uh, movement. I call it a movement, not just a union, because from 95 through 99, it was an informal uh, gathering of workers, regular gatherings in public parks and in Maria's basement, um, before they actually um, waged an effort to gain control of the union's formal apparatus. Uh, so, um, 
And there were certain issues that, that bore more heavily on women than others. The issue of sexual harassment on the job sometimes came up. It wasn't a very frequent thing, but it was there. So, yeah. Well, we've run out of time for further questions today, and we'll have to stop. So please join us on February 5th for the State of the City with uh, address with Mayor Sam Adams. And as we close, please join me in expressing our appreciation to today's speaker, Paul Apostolidis. <laughs> <laughs>